Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Tech for Good, Empowering AI Leadership. Um, I'm sure you've heard so much you know, over the past few years about how AI is going to transform your business, transform your industry, uh, and change just about every aspect of public life, from schooling to policing to medicine. Uh, indeed, by some estimates, artificial intelligence has the potential to improve the efficiency of businesses by 40% by 2030, unlocking some 14 trillion in untapped potential. But of course, any powerful technology can do harm as well as good. And so when AI and machine learning is being used to make more and more decisions, more and more critical decisions, it is vitally important that we consider how those decisions are made and what the impact of those decisions are on real people. And you only have to look at some, some real examples to see why this is so important. We have algorithms being used to decide whether people get receive bail. We have uh, algorithms now being used in hospitals to help doctors diagnose cancer. And we have people experimenting with using AI algorithms to help curate pe children's educations. And this obviously isn't just an academic issue. It's vitally important for business leaders and politicians too. And since AI knows no national borders, really, uh, it's important that we come to some sort of international agreement as to what even constitutes AI for good. You know, and so personally, as someone who covers technology, I think this is a very poignant issue because you know, I don't think you can ever really consider technology in isolation of people. You know, from the earliest flint tools to the latest self-driving cars, those things don't mean anything really without a person involved. Um, and just as any technology can be used to do amazing things, it can have um, unintended consequences, it can be, can be used for harm as well. So I think it's incredibly important. And I think as we've, in recent years, become fascinated by the idea of this amazing idea, long distance idea about AI being something other than human beings being so powerful um, that we've lost sight of the fact that it is intimately related to, to us. At the same time, I worry that some of the reaction to the ethical issues being, or the ethical questions being raised by AI are sometimes, cause, sometimes resulting in a, something of a backlash that may mean that the good side of the technology is uh, sometimes held back. So without further ado, let me introduce our four fantastic panelists. To my left, we have Satsuki Katayama, Minister of State for Regional Rejuvenation of Japan. Next is Chen Liming, Chairman of Greater China Group for IBM Corporation. Next is Joanna Bryson, an Associate Professor at the Department of Computer Science at Bath University and a well-known expert on AI ethics. And last but by no means least, Anand Rao, the Global Leader for Artificial Intelligence at PricewaterhouseCoopers, or PwC, I should say. Um, okay, so I want to start the discussion, and please be aware we will open the floor to questions from you, so think about what you'd like to ask these uh, esteemed panelists. I want to open by taking the title of the, the session, Tech for Good, or AI for Good, and asking everybody what that means to them. So, Minister first, yeah. please. Thank you, Mora. Thank you much, moderator. My name is Satsuki Katayama. I'm a minister in charge of regulatory, regional revitalization and regulatory reforms. Uh, the reason why Japan is uh, trying to make a law called super city law. Super city means super smart city because in Japan, the notion of smart city has been used so widely uh, in the next last decades without using any high technology of AI, just economizing uh, energy or uh, less time consuming things are called simply smart. So in order to change the notion, we put super. <laughs> okay. And you know, any democratic countries, the law or legislation are planned and presented to the diet, the reason for good. No evil reasons. Mm -hmm. we, any government will present the law or any legislator don't do that. Mm -hmm. So the reason that we do that is to maintain Japanese aging societies quality of life eternally, taking a full advantage of AI big data. 
And in addition to that, last weekend, the first international forum that had been deemed important in the G20 ministers' communique was held in Osaka, Japan on June 29, concurrently with the G20 Osaka summit. As you know, uh, leaders of 20 countries decided upon some item with regard to AI ethics. And they agreed upon starting data free flow with trust, but not the contents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting phenomenon. And uh, the forum was participated by experts from countries with proven record on some smart cities, including European countries, including European Union, and United States, China, and India, so on. And this, the very first forum in the world, has been supported by World Economic Forum, mm -hmm. thanking all of you. Okay. And just before coming here, I spoke with Dr. Schwab that we continue this conversation on the next Davos, and we still go on. And the basic concept of our super city law is as follows. As you know, a range of verification trial tests have been already been conducted <coughs> in such field as self-driving cars or automated cars, bus, cashless society, and remote education, remote operation of medical operations, and so on. However, measures to link all the initiatives implemented in multiple fields on a data linkage platform has not been existed yet. And apply the result for the daily life of people are still very much limited, mainly because of the fear of damage, mm -hmm. because we still don't know who, who are to be responsible. Excellent. And probably uh, mainly because of regulations even in the United States, that's okay. what I say. So our law includes, includes two provisions, and provision on the project to establish and improve data linkage platform to collect, organize, and provide data for multiple advanced service, services and provisions to give entities implementing such projects the right to ask the national and local governments to provide them with the data owned by the governments, and provisions on the special procedures to be taken to foster the integrated and comprehensive, comprehensive implementation of a regulatory reforms across multiple fields based upon one single plan, whereas regulatory reforms tend to be made individually so that multiple advanced services will be provided concurrently and in an integrated manner in a so-called super city. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, it would eventually be important for citizens to reach consensus on the SDGs. So our goal is yeah. from the beginning links to SDGs. Okay. Everybody deem as good. Well, that's fantastic. We'll, we'll come back to some of those issues because yes. I think Thank that, you very much. That's, sure. all, that's all. Wonderful. So, yeah, that touches on so many issues that are going to be important for the yeah. future of, of technology and how it affects people. So, Chen, would you like to give us your, your take? Uh, for the purpose of diversity, You're gonna <laughs> I'll speak in Chinese, if you do not mind. Um, so, just now, uh, Will, in his opening remarks, said that uh, the concept of tech for good, what does that mean for all of us? I think that tech for good represents a beautiful vision for all of us. It is a direction for us to working toward. However, tech for good is far from being a reality. So this is uh, the first thing I want to point out. Yesterday, a friend of mine, out of curiosity, visited a facial recognition gadget in the exhibition area and uh, the experience was very sorrowful for him and I want to share with you the results of his uh, facial recognition uh, experience. So this friend is uh, Chinese but uh, the reading of the machine said he is Caucasian and uh, he is not a very nice person. He has very low happiness. 
and uh, low attractiveness, and uh, also uh, very uh, low social uh, networking ability, and also a very high level of uh, aggressiveness. So this is the experience of my friend with uh, facial recognition technology. I have known him for many years, and uh, this is not a person I know. So I don't believe I'm wrong. So the reason I believe lies with the algorithm embedded in this technology. So as we can see, this is a clear example of bias from technology. I believe the developers of this technology do not hold or harbor any personal grudge against my friend. But uh, there is no denying that systems and technologies are capable of bias or error. So this is a objective or unintentional bias. But of course, in the process of developing technologies, there are also some intentional or sometimes uh, biases that developers were unaware of. Based on your uh, personal data or personal information, they will design different technologies. For example, if they know you are rich, they will give you a technology that will charge you more. So these are some more examples of uh, algorithm bias. So tech for good is a vision we want to realize in the future. But to make that happen, we need to make uh, more government regulations, such as the GDPR in Europe and many other national policies. But still, there are many countries that are not making these efforts. So we see great gap and disparities among different nations. For the business community, we also need to pay attention to social ethics. For individuals, we also need to apply a higher level of self-discipline. Do not download whatever apps they push to you because you may give your consents without uh, proper knowledge of what that means or the potential consequences for you. So there are many uh, cases for the interest of time I will not enumerate, but uh, we can have more discussions on that. A lot of the technologies have such an inherent, inherent defects. Some technologies were designed to cause damage, others have a very good intention but caused unintended consequences. So uh, we can discuss more later. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Joanna. Okay. Hello. Um, uh, the first thing I was intending to say, mm -hmm. <laughs> I guess I will say it first still, is that when we think of artificial intelligence, yeah, I can take this off too. Okay. <laughs> when we think of artificial intelligence for good, um, it isn't entirely sensible. It isn't AI that does good. Artificial intelligence is an aspect of technology. It's a set of software techniques that we use to build systems. And we use it as individuals, or as corporations, or as governments, or as NGOs. We develop these systems for our purposes. And so the point is, when we talk about AI for good, are we really talking about um, generating good, or are we displacing the responsibility onto the technology or onto the engineers? Because we really shouldn't allow the, the fact that we have uh, intelligence that seems to be uh, human-like in some aspect, like it uses language or something, mm -hmm. and then mistake that to mean that there's another um, agent that has responsibility. We cannot hold machines themselves responsible. All of human, I mean, Justice is a human invention. It is something, you know, you can see animals that kind of hold each other into a place too. But all those ideas of responsibility, the means by which we punish each other, those are things that we will never build a machine that will uh, necessarily respond in the way that humans necessarily respond to be isolated, 
to be removed from their, their power, from their wealth, from their families. These are things that for humans and for any social animal is a huge dysphoria. Mm -hmm. I want to say uh, quickly on this, this uh, demo, this is a, a great example of something that in, in Britain, we have been working on AI, we had an AI ethics, national level AI ethics policy since 2011. And one of the most important things, it's, there's only five principles, and the fourth one is that the machine nature should always be transparent. You should know how this system works. And let me tell you how that system works, because I was fortunate, and I went to the hub and found out by the maker, it was an artist. Mm. It was an artist deliberately deceiving. And I have heard a lot of colleagues here that are very upset because they think AI is this wonderful, magical thing. And then this thing told them complete lies about themselves, <laughs> right? But it was a joke by an artist. That is not the state of the art. That's not the best thing that could be done. It was something that is being used to disrupt our understanding of AI. Right, right. So on the one hand, a lot of people are promising too much. But there's some people even here at the forum who have been given a platform to disunderstand, you know, to reduce understanding as well. <laughs> and and so, so I think it is important that, I mean, artistically, with proper debriefing, this is a good thing to understand that the technology is built for a purpose. And in this case, the purpose was to make you not believe technology, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. I think you're absolutely right. I th it's a wonderful, I, I think it's a very interesting installation. And I think at a time when there is an enormous amount of hype around AI, we want to sort of temper that, but perhaps. But you need to debrief. In, in <laughs> psychology, my first degree was psychology. And in psychology, if you deceive during the experiment, at the end of the experiment, right. you make sure the subjects know, and people are wandering around not knowing what was going on there. Right. We can say that about AI itself. I think people don't know what's going on. R Raul, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Continue. Transparency. AI for good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. You just mentioned hype. So the way we come at it is very much try and demystify the notion of AI, AI for good, AI for ethics, responsible AI. There are all of these terms being thrown around. And what we are focusing much more on, how do you actually make it practical for businesses? So now let me take AI for good. Uh, we look at it from two perspectives. One is when a business m uses an AI algorithm, makes a certain decisions, what does it mean for that particular bank or a healthcare company to be doing the right thing or the good thing? Now, uh, Professor Jonah Bryson mentioned the ethics and the number of principles. There are a number of organizations that have come up with the ethical principles. Those ethical principles, I think, broadly the businesses accept. But how do you translate those ethics into something that the front line can execute? AI will do good and will be beneficial to humanity. I don't think anyone from a financial institution or a healthcare institution would challenge that. Of course we want AI to be good. But now how does that translate when there is a uh, machine learning algorithm essentially deciding whether someone should get a mortgage loan or not? What variables should it be using? Can it use the zip code in US as a variable when it is highly correlated right. with some of the other uh, problematic gender ethnicity, right? So that's what we are here to try and translate some of those ethics, we call it contextualization, into something that's very practical for the different companies at the front end. So that is one aspect of AI for good. And then I think a, a couple of the panelists already mentioned, we're also not just looking at AI for taking profit and, and using it in the businesses, can we use it to address more societal problems in the world, right? So problems related to the planet, problems related to equality and humanity as such, and problems related to other species. So that is the other notion for AI for good. And there we just essentially adopt UNDP 17 goals, right? So anything where you are working towards profit or not profit, if you're working towards those goals, then that is AI for good. Right, excellent. Okay, well, let's, let's dive more into how companies can responsibly use AI, mm -hmm. use technology, because I think that's a very pertinent um, topic right now. And I, I want to turn to Joanna because I don't know if, if uh, people here know, but she was part of the, the panel set up by Google, the ill-fated, I think it lasted all of 48 hours. Well, I think I still have a contract, actually, but oh, I, okay, okay. I signed the contract in November. So this was, Google wanted to set up an AI ethics panel to help it, an independent group to help it guide its own <clears throat> uh, activities in AI but it met with a huge amount of resistance from employees. So tell us 
what, well, not, I shouldn't say huge. It met with resistance that blew up into a big story. So tell us about that. Oh, well, okay. Um, I, I, in a way, I'm not entirely sure what happened either. And I think this comes back to this, this conversation about that AI is everywhere right now. And, and in fact, I don't even like talking about AI. I think in 10 years, we'll be talking about the digital transformation. Right. So the, there's a feeling that you shouldn't trust any corporation whatsoever. Uh, and some people have that feeling. And some people particularly don't trust the big tech giants that know so much and are getting so much money. And so you would think then in that case, they would want something that might help make the system better. And a lot of people did. A lot of people were excited. I got lots of you know, single emails, single tweets, single LinkedIn, whatever those are, uh, things where people said, wow, this is great. You're definitely going to tell us what's going on there. We look forward to, to you participating. I hope you can make any difference. You know, those kinds of messages, lots of positive messages. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there was a small number of people, many of whom, most of whom I had no idea who they were, that were very persistent that this is, they were trying to find a way to tear it down. Mm -hmm. And after a, a little while, like, you know, I don't know, 30 hours, they really focused on one thing. There was one particular right. member who was out of line with most of the tech giants' uh, uh, political perspectives. Now, I wouldn't say that that member is very well aligned with my political perspectives either, uh, but on the other hand, that Google is a transnational company. It's certainly at least a national company, and two of the members of the tech of the board were um, politicians, or political operatives at least, from the right and left. And, they, and, and the one on the right was completely excluded on the basis of a couple of the positions that she held that were held by her institution um, and that she expressed. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, and it was interesting that they mostly uh, seemed to go after, there, there was one other woman that was yeah. conservative in a drone yeah. too, that they started with her and they kind of stopped it. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know if that's actually that interesting in a way, but in, in, you know, what, what happened in the end was that Google itself withdrew support after one or two of the other board members, which they had carefully designed this board to be a group of people that were strong-willed, uh, loud, but also uh, had some chance of listening, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that they would hope would update their opinions and would, would come to consensus on things, and that yeah. they hoped would sort of bullet, you know, would, would stress test their policies before they released them into the public. So that's what it was supposed to be for. Right, it, was, right, it was a stress test for policies. Seems like a very sensible idea. Yeah, I mean, so why they couldn't, I don't understand why they couldn't themselves, they're a communication company, communicate to their own people um, yeah. uh, what, what, why they needed to have that kind of balance or that their company couldn't really convince them if, you know, I, 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 my, my, my opinion is that probably they were right to have this broad balance, right. but one way or the other, they should be able to come to a consensus. Instead, they just you know, cancel culture. They threw the whole thing out and right. that seems like a very strange move. Well, in, to me, I mean, I, I think that, you know, science and technology historically is a force for good. Or, it, you know, overall, it, it can be a, a great force for good handled with care. And um, it is surprise, sometimes potentially a little bit alarming how much of a backlash there seems to be against the idea of technology being a force for good. It's almost like it's um, inherently a force for bad sometimes think, at the moment. I think it's very, again, I don't want to divide. Uh, the, the, more, the more AI becomes, uh, you know, that we become good, it's skilled at using AI, mm -hmm. the less it makes sense to differentiate between AI and just normal human behavior. And you right. can see all through history, yes, you're right, in some sense it's a force for good in that there's more and more and more people. Yeah. Um, now we're dealing with the sustainability, the very well brought up sustainability goals that maybe we don't want more and more and more people dominating the ecosystem uh, to, to the exclusion of other forms of life. Right, right. Um, and so, so that could suddenly very quickly turn into a global bad, even though it looked like it was good for a while, yeah. if all of a sudden, you know, there's a nuclear war or something. Right, right. So, so right. It, they're, they're <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Okay, um, Chen, let me bring you in. You're, you're you know, very prominent at a, a, a large company that's been working on AI for a very long time. How does, how does that inform your perspective of this, this idea of technology being either good or bad or an AI being good or bad? Um, I must declare in, English is not my mother's tongue, not even my father's. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, therefore, I'm not so sure if I hear John clearly. Did you say that you do not trust the big corporations just now? <laughs> you did, I guess. I, I, 
I said you know, that I doubted one of the decisions one okay. of them took. Yeah. So I, working with a big corporate, I feel disappointed to hear this. So just to be a little oh, bit no, controversial. Oh no, no, no. I didn't. I didn't. I um, didn't. I didn't say that I didn't trust big corporations in general. I wouldn't have been working with them if I didn't think that big corporations are absolutely a part of out of, of our right. life. Right. Uh, let me just uh, switch back to Chinese so that. Now, I think that this. Well, to a larger extent, I think business has driven the progress of the society, the improvement of efficiency, and also the improvement of well-being. And the Business Institute is also the major body of innovation. The universities has done a lot of researches. However, to some extent, universities are not the major body of innovation. Therefore, I believe that the businesses, enterprises, they have played a vital role for our society to go forward. So we cannot undervaluate the contribution enterprises have made to our society. And this is my first point. And for the second point, as for the tech for good or tech for bad, as I mentioned before, Historically speaking, there are so many technologies has been invented for bad. For example, for example, the mass destruction weapons. Nobody will claim that the invention of such weapons is for good. And actually, the weapon itself and the improvement of weapon, you can think about what we're using those weapons for. But actually, we still have some technologies are designed, are invented for good, for a good future. We know a chemical called DDT. It has difficult to translate. I have this in my pocket. I can read this to you. It's a long DDT. It's a pesticide. Was all. And. There was also another pesticide with a very long ancient name. Uh, we call it triple six. When those pesticides was invented in the first place, we thought they were chemical miracles. But we all know that both of the two chemicals we've just mentioned, both the pesticide has brought us catastrophic disasters to human beings. And uh, even nowadays, we can detect uh, its residues in 99% of our entire population. And of course, these has been uh, stopped use. And recently, it's uh, glasphene, and that is a weed remover. And uh, it was designed for improving the agriculture, uh, for the weed control. Uh, so. Technologies and new things that invented for good perhaps will also create a bad result. And therefore, in my opinion, first of all, for the enterprises, when you are making the innovation, creating a new technology, you should have uh, a purpose to design it for good. And for example, some of the companies, when they are designing a new algorithm, they are not designing it for good. Perhaps they are trying to use that algorithm to get your privacy, to get your personal data, so that I can make more profit out of it. And I think this is a tech for bad, that you are purposefully doing it for bad. So this is not something we need to do and something not we're going to do. And secondly, the enterprises should take up the due responsibilities. For example, the transparency and the trust that you established with your algorithm, the explainable algorithm that is not dark. Nobody knows what happens with it. So we will know this algorithm will contribute to the human society, to our progress to improve our well-being. And you can 
improve the efficiency of the business operation. And I think at IBM, we have a lot of uh, cases. For example, AI's application in healthcare, in uh, industrial manufacturing. For example, we can use a, a video checking process for the quality control. And uh, we have production line uh, quality control, and uh, and this is also useful for human resources management. We have a lot of um, cases, and if time allowed, I can share with you more. I want to push you and say, well, how do we guarantee? How do you ensure that the companies and the people working in those companies do? make sure their technology is used for good. People have, you know, lots of companies have come up with their code of ethics. People have talked about a Hippocratic oath for technologists or AI researchers. What is the, or, you know, should there be more regulation? What, what would you say, I'm, I'm, I, Joan is itching. What, what, to, I, I'm to, itching to sorry. jump in on this, yeah. Well, there, there's, there's uh, first of all, uh, I, I never criticized uh, business in general <laughs> or even one business in specific, only a, one decision by one business. Right. Um, I, yeah, but, but secondly, um, I totally uh, uh, agree that there's fundamental, well, okay, I don't think there's anything we can do when we build technology to determine. I agree with all your examples of technology that was built for good, and in most cases, it, could, it couldn't have been known at the time how badly it might be used. Right. Specifically, I think this, the AI revolution is one thing, but the main revolution is actually digital. Once you have information out there, People can use it, you know, you could have good people will use it in a good way, bad people use it in a bad way. And we, we can work hard on cybersecurity and we can try to ensure that our, our data cannot be repurposed. For mm -hmm. example, we have laws now that, um, the, uh, in America at least, uh, that the, um, some of the data assets of a company cannot be sold on, even if they go into bankrupt. Right. At least certain data assets are protected. And that's a really important law because uh, otherwise it can fall, you know, things that were given for one reason can fall to someone else. But cybersecurity has that same threat. Mm -hmm. I mean, the example I often use, and this has nothing to do with even digital, but when, when uh, the, the Nazis invaded uh, the Netherlands and Belgium, they, uh, in the Netherlands were very organized, had a lot of data about their citizens. They never did anything bad with it, but when the Nazis got there, they did something very bad with it. With the Belgians, they were very disorganized. They didn't know anything about their citizens, and so far more of their Jewish population survived just right. because their country was less organized. Um, so, it, and that was even pre-digital. So we have to realize, and, and I wanna say that there aren't only problems, there are solutions. Mm -hmm. And so cybersecurity is one solution, Another solution is communicating about accountability, that we have to hold the people who build the system are obliged to show that they are using best practice and due diligence just like it would be in any kind of other mm -hmm. manufacturing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So then they keep good records, and I'm sure IBM does this, they keep good records about who changed the code base, who used the machine learning, what data they trained it on. You keep these records, and then when we come to regulation, what governments have to be able to do is audit those accounts and be able to attribute blame if the stuff is being used the wrong way. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we the, need to just yeah. raise the standard yeah. of, of so the, the, I mean, I think the way we are talking, it's, it, it feels to me at least that we are saying that there's a whole lot of new things that everyone needs to do. But if you actually go into businesses, there are existing practices, exactly. right? Yeah. So risk is something that almost every organization yeah. of a decent size has a chief risk officer. They look at all of these risks that we just talked about, right? So there are data associated risks, the personally identifiable information. It's not new. AI is suddenly not brought in personally identifiable information that's been there. How AI is using that information is something that we need to essentially govern about. Yeah. So what I would suggest is a more fruitful discussion. It's not that whether we need some of these things or how it is, but essentially get down to much more of a practical approach. How do we translate some of the very specific AI things, right? So in terms of where does the data come from and is the data of a particular lineage of a particular uh, segment Absolutely. and therefore it is biased. So mm -hmm. now you be very cognizant when you're building a model 
model as to why you're building a model and what data are you using so that you can be very conscious in saying this model cannot be used for anything other than this region for what, what it was built. Right. And building those practices into the organization is what we are saying needs to happen. And that's the way yeah. we are okay. going about tailing responsible AI use. Just super short. Yeah. I, I just want to say totally yeah. right, and but there are a lot of companies using machine learning, again, because of this anthropomorphism, mm -hmm. they aren't following the good practices that all the other companies that use AI, like the automotive industry and mm -hmm. all these other industries, medical industry, right, yeah. they use these practices with AI, and yet the AI companies themselves, like Facebook, mm -hmm. you know, That's, may not necessarily yeah. Right, have used, used the basic it. the basic basic skills of software engineering okay. that they should have. So there's another division here. Sorry, just yeah. one point here is I think they're a very valid point. I think you need to take away the notion of governance of AI out of the data scientist view and into the broader business view. Okay. I think that is critical. So, well, data scientists have a I'm certain not, view, but it's a broader view that we want. On that yeah. note, let's also bring That's it into the, the government perspective as well. So, so Minister Katiyam, I want it. No, would yeah, you, would you I, was, I was listening with very uh, much interested, uh, especially with Professor Ms. Bion. Bryson. Ms. Bryson. Bryson. Uh, I have a question. Uh, oh. You mentioned many important things. And as a position of government, uh, do you think is there any particular additional rules for procurement of AI-related service or software or things? And to another you, and do you think uh, in what way international society are to liberalize fully equipped automatic AI-driven car driving? As you know, in any of our countries, it's not feasible because we are all member of an international treaty that in automobiles driven in public way, there must be someone I mean, human being mm -hmm. is in the car. And mm -hmm. all casualty laws with regard to automobile right. are made based upon that. That person, right. That's a very important key issue ruling that any government is considering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you say? Uh, yes. uh, well, um, the, so you, I think I, to quickly say something about this last rule before the, the, the I know in the UK, uh, we're partly relying on a rule that already said that you couldn't let your horse take your cart home <laughs> without a person in it for exactly this right. reason. And this is one of the rules that people, of course, are arguing about. Um, but anyway, back to the procurement question. Um, in, in general, as I, I normally say, there's not that many laws we need to change for regulation for exactly the reasons you said. The things we need to do is to create the legislative bodies that have uh, uh, the regulatory bodies that have the expertise to apply existing manufacturing rule into the into the um, in, in laws into the software industry. However, for procurement, it may be a little different, uh, and I honestly, it is not my big area of expertise. But my main, my main concern, again, is how do you ensure the cybersecurity and particularly the firewall? If you wind up using, so traditionally, how do you maintain, uh, how do you control corruption? The, the model economists had was you want a bunch of mid-sized companies and a government and they all kind of keep track of each other and they try to keep each other from becoming corrupt. Um, now we're talking about transnational companies that have assets nobody else has. Right? So, so for example, with Google, going back to Google, they build their own chips. They don't trust anyone. They have their own fiber optic cables. Since they found out that the American government was hacking them, they now encrypt everything even within the company, not only outside the company, all their internet traffic. So they have resources that most countries could not afford right, right. and would never replicate. In fact, the EU cannot make its own chips, but Google makes its own chips. Right. So, on, so. That, on that note, you know, um, Alphabet's related to Google's Sidewalks Labs have um, released, recently released their proposal for a smart city in Toronto, and they came up with the idea of a, or they previously came up with the idea of a data trust mm. that, that would be would be owned maybe by the Toronto Library. I, I'm I'm wondering, 
Minister, what do, you, what do you think of this? Is this a good way to sort of avoid there being unintended consequences or to simply shift the risk somewhere, somewhere else? Yeah, I don't, I don't think, I can't do well imagine anyone or any company or any government can completely shift any risk with regard to the use of AI. That's why the things are so complicated. Mm. But uh, according to your notion, I feel that um, there is some resemblance to p productive product liability discussion. Yeah, that's right. Long, it's a yeah. long discussion. So uh, again, there are more than 30 countries yeah. looking at their national AI strategy. Yeah. And one of the main things there is what do we regulate? Is there a need for a new regulation? Uh, so this is where I think, again, we need to just go back and look at the existing legislation and see how they need to be modified. Uh, give an example, autonomous vehicles. I think Germany came out with a list of principles on what does it really mean in terms of liability. I know Japan, you also have done something similar for robots, right? So there, again, we, all of those economies are very dependent or very, very focused on robotics or manufacturing. So there are very specific things that governments are looking at. Drones being another good example where we don't have mm -hmm. some of those aviation rules have not been adapted for drone flying. Should we completely ban it? I don't think so. Uh, but we, should we allow them in air traffic control areas? Probably not, right? So how exactly? So th those are some of the more concrete things I think we need doing. But then there's also the broader notion, I think, which we mentioned earlier as to how some of this information is being used and personalized and what additional uh, changes in rules that we need, right? So, for example, U.S. as a fair lending act, it has been there. And this non-discrimination has been uh, in the statutes for decades now, right, around from 60s. So those things still apply, but now people are using these algorithms in a way that we need to go deeper and then say more, be more explicit on what they can or cannot do, right? right? So that's what we mean by the governance, which in some cases the regulators uh, might step in. In some cases, the, uh, the companies need to do it just because it's good practice. Mm -hmm. So again, we distinguish between ethical and legal. Uh, yes, legal, you have to do it. But ethical, you better do it because that's the right thing to do. Don't mm -hmm. look for a law from a EU or a UK government to tell. It's the right thing to do for your customers. And one of the things that we didn't bring out is trust. The AI will completely fail if the consumers don't trust that either the companies or the governments right. value what they are doing, right? So in that sense, if they, without the trust, it will all fail. So right. I think uh, in order to engender the trust, we need to follow those ethical principles in a, in a way that, that sort of okay. works. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. OK, I want to take some questions from the audience. So please, yeah. Um, I don't know if we have, do you have microphones? Yep, just, just down here, please. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Uh, very, very uh, scintillating discussion. Uh, one of the things that, uh, or a quote rather, kept coming in my mind as I was uh, listening to everyone was, my old law school professor used to say, uh, sunlight is the best disinfectant. And um, as we're talking about these proprietary data sets, what's really interesting is the inherent network effect of these data sets and also the inherent monopolies. Uh, Mr. Rao, I love what you said about legal, ethical. Uh, may I add another thing to that, which is commercial. Mm -hmm. How do we get these companies to come out with their data sets out of their own volition? And that's where I think it's really, really powerful uh, one idea, as I have some really influential people here, is perhaps an uh, analogous regime to patents, where we know that uh, it has worked for centuries, where there's a lot of uh, proprietary information that companies possess. Nevertheless, we've created this regime where folks are coming out of their own volition and uh, making that uh, uh, into the public domain. And also perhaps some data exchanges where mm -hmm. we could add that commercial layer to it. Uh, nevertheless, thank you for a wonderful that's panel. A, that's a fantastic point. I think um, one, one place where this is, I think it really hits home is if you consider self-driving cars, right? If you've got these vehicles being tested on public roads with innocent people around, it's, it's almost a public good for those 
companies to share their data so that everybody can improve their, their system. So can, do you think that's possible? Yeah. The, other, the other thing, uh, sorry, the other thing that's, uh, I think, back to what you were saying, uh, is I think we'll arrive at a technology solution specifically for data. You mentioned data exchange. If you combine the data exchange with the blockchain concept, and then we want people, so there are maybe certain fundamental things. We want people who generate the data or companies who generate the data, again, ultimate being the, the people, to own the data. But then you want the people at their own uh, volition be able to give aspects of that data, specific variables at a time, for a specific purpose, for a specific duration. So all those three need to be combined. So I can give my health data to my life insurance company just for today for them to give me a life insurance code. After today, it vanishes. They can't use it for any other purpose. That's the kind of thing that we need to do. Once we do that, then we can decide whether the government is sort of taxing it or someone else is benefiting for keeping that data. But I think the technology solution will come very similar to what you are saying. And I think the number of companies are working on it. I think uh, World Economic Forum is also looking at yeah. some of those areas. Yeah, yeah. Joanna. I, I think, I have to say, I haven't heard somebody talk about data in terms of like patent law where you had a certain, or a copyright possibly, how long. It makes a lot of sense to me. However, <laughs> there's a big problem, which is of course all the personal data. So you have uh, obligations. Uh, I, I, I have a slide in, in more slidey things where, where you say, uh, data is the new oil, storing it is dangerous. And I show lots of explosions, you know. So you don't want too much of this oil in your company necessarily, and what you do have, you have a lot of obligations to protect. So I think we have to, it, it's gonna be a little more complicated than that. And one of the things that we were just talking about in an, one of the hubs is also about um, revenue. So it may be, you, you want exposure of data, as was just mentioned, for, for certain kinds of uh, applications. But another thing you might want is to say, hey, you, you're making money off of data that you've, you've acquired and you've consolidated. A lot of people treat data like it's just all lying there infinitely, whatever. Mm -hmm. No, you, it, you have, how you represent it matters a lot. And, the, and you put a lot of, there's a lot of computational, there's literally energy and costs of storage and, and, and creating a data set is not just like, stealing a bunch of people's souls or something like the old idea of cameras, right? Um, so you, you've got this asset that is, that is shaped specifically for your business. Maybe what you really need to do is just pay some tax, <laughs> right? But re, make sure that there's some redistribution going back to the people from whom that data was derived. Don't necessarily make it into data that's usable for anything because that might actually, re uh, again, open this exposure to it being used for bad. Mm, the commercial nature, which obviously companies want to commercialize. Shannon, yes, would you, would you be willing, would IBM be willing to, to share its data? Um, let me just uh, still uh, make a few comments before I, I come to the data point. Uh, first of all, you know, see, just now we talked about many things regarding the risk associated to technology, but we also need to recognize in general, technology has uh, you know, significantly enhanced the societal progress <laughs> and increased the you know, say, uh, working efficiency and improved our life. You know, from the invention of the wheel that has you know, uh, made the mobility possible, from the medicine that has you know, improved the, you know, uh, our, our living standard and, and, and age, uh, uh, longevity and, and, and also you know, information that has a significant e enhanced efficiency and so on and so forth. Just now you're talking about you know, how we are going to use tech you know, for commercial, you know, add another dimension. I fully agree with you. That's a major, major element. Any of the tech without a commercial, uh, commercialization, there is no longevity, uh, longevity of the tech itself. You know, can you think of any technology that has not been utilized by anybody that can survive. It can survive for one day, two, one, two days, but it cannot survive for long. So therefore, technology application in commercial is a very, very critical. In IBM, we said last wave of transformation happened from outside in. From outside in means, you know, see, very often those disruptors are coming from outside the industries, you know, the people who are not in the taxi company, 
but you know, the, due to the platform, they become you know, a disruptor to the taxi companies. You know, you know, you know, in China, we call this a DD, and then in the US, we call this Uber, all right? And, and there, are, there are the companies that has u utilized the platform to disrupt the you know, hotel industries, you know, see, uh, so on and so forth. There are many, many of these kind of examples. But we also w w believe the next wave of transformation will come from inside. Next wave of the so next waves, uh, next wave of transformation will be from uh, internal of uh, businesses, especially uh, inside each and every sectors. Uh, the uh, flagship enterprises they will set up their own platforms. In they will utilize their data better. Eighty-five percent of the data are behind uh, firewalls still today, and uh, to go uh, further, the data we have collected uh, are only one percent of of the collect collectible data, lots of uh, data, we have not uh, collected them yet. Uh, or after collection, we are not using them. Let me give you an example, uh, the wearables. Uh, wearables, uh, I, uh, through wear wearables, uh, you collect uh, lots of data. Uh, I st maybe uh, you can uh, publish it uh, in the moments, but uh, my doctor is not uh, seeing my data. He does not know my exercises daily. He does not know my daily activities. Uh, so it's not being utilized. So many data are not being mined. So technology in the process uh, should play a crucial role, whether it's AI or big data analysis or cloud or uh, uh, data security or any other. I believe technology in commercialization has uh, a big potential, uh, including in the health sector, in, in medical health, uh, in uh, in industrial operations, even in uh, human resources management of companies, uh, big data analytics uh, and AI, uh, they can find lots of uh, scenarios for applications so that a different sector and the tech themselves uh, can enjoy longevity. Not only invention, after invention, you do not put them on shelves. They can put it to use to improve your work and life. Another question, yes. Um, do you want to just wait for the microphone? Thank you all for the session. Uh, Mohammed Musa, founder and CEO of Deep in AI. Uh, kind of touching upon healthcare and in autonomous vehicles where, where I work, and I used to work for Google, so uh, for the Google, IBM, Uber, Tesla that have tons and tons of data that is, uh, and, and also for healthcare, pharma companies that have a lot of data on genes and human behavior, et cetera. The, in a pre-competitive market where you don't have a standard product that is already out, uh, that data is, like you said, is the new oil. So it's very hard for these companies to convince themselves to share that data and make it accessible for others because it will reduce their competitive capability. And from a regulation perspective, if you try to force them to collaborate, it's actually today not relevant because in autonomous vehicles, for example, each car is using different sensor suite, different cameras, different formats. So even if you, if you share the data, it's not gonna be very useful. And uh, so if you create an entity that allows, which actually I'm trying to do with my company, to create an entity that allows data sharing across heterogeneous formats, uh, you risk becoming a monopoly, and, and then that needs another kind of regulation complexity. Uh, so I'd love to kind of uh, hear your thoughts on that and how we can have both a carrot and a stick so that the companies that have a ton of data actually have an incentive to share uh, without you know, creating uh, disadvantages for society. I know this might be a complex question, but love to hear your thoughts. Minister Katayama. Yeah, thank you very much. That's a very interesting point. You know, uh, in, our in our proposed legislation, we, uh, I think, I personally think we should require minimal interoperability among several cities and among cities and government. 
Uh, the reason why we require minimal interoperability is for the benefit of the whole country, the whole human being, because the more the interoperability exists, the more the goodness that can bring about will increase. It's clear, crystal clear. But, you know, autonomous, uh, very flat operability is no more necessary because the system is already being open. We are living in an open source way, uh, open, open data waste world, so it's no more necessary. That's why, and this law is the first one to signify the data linkage platform in legislation. Uh, we think this tendency will continue. And uh, another thing is uh, we have to be agile in setting rules or making progress or uh, making new something new in business or legislation because the advance, the speed of the increase or progress of each field is too rapid. Uh, for example, I visited Alibaba's main office in Kaohsiung, and they told me very kindly that they can economize 20% of traffic jam with 4,000 camera in the city. That's great, that's one thing. Using 2,000 server of IBM, Hewlett, Fujitsu, it's not quantum computer, it's ordinary computer. Oh, that's good. Because this is a public job. They wanted to do that, that's good. And next month, I was told that a new software company in the United States can economize 3-0 percentage of traffic jam only using 20 or 30 percent of the traffic, of the car existing in one city. And this morning, in this meeting, I was told by an emerging new company that only 5% of the car living in the city. That data can reduce 50% of traffic jam of the city, the scale mm -hmm. of Los Angeles. So that's day-to-day -day evolution. It's nonsense to designate and verify uh, in very details the loose. That's the difficulty that all agencies and governments are facing. So we try to neutral and we try to not to anti-progress. Yeah. And we, that's why we, Japan proposed uh, in G20 that free data flow with right, trust. Right. That's the difficulty. Anyone else? Would, yeah. So, yeah, I away? wanted to comment on the scenarios that you just sort of laid out in terms of the data and who owns the data. The data network effect has been well documented. As you just said, the, very specifically for AI, there is an inherent bias for larger companies to own the data because mm -hmm. you have more data, the machine learning algorithm gets better, which means you personalize your services, so more customers come, more data, right? So there's a virtuous cycle playing and it's been well documented that you will create those monopolies. Now, the, the solution to this is still very open, right? So I, again, people have talked about three potential scenarios that the world could move into, right? So we are very much used to the government controlling or larger bodies of government sort of legislating and controlling. So they could potentially break up large monopolies like that, right? So that's one scenario where the government still hold the power. But now what we are seeing is the emergence of supranational kind of bodies as well as sort of companies which are multinational and their GDPs are probably, uh, their, their revenues are far more than any GDP of many of the countries. Mm -hmm. So that's where the corporates could wield that power and all that data or thirdly, this is where I think we potentially need to go, at least in my view, is the individuals own the data, right? So today we don't have the technology and the economics for the individuals to own that data and make it available to either the corporation or the, the governments. That's why the other two entities are owning and have the power, right? So which way the world would go? Is it the, the, the traditional government or the, the corporations or the individuals is unclear in my view. Okay, well, I'm sorry, Joanna, th th we're running out of time, and uh, I think I just need to, to try and wrap up the, the, the tour. So let me just, just, just um, bring, a, bring out a few key points, I think, really important. Um, one, one is to demystify AI, de demystify technology ex itself, and it's particularly 
been a problem with AI so that people understand um, more what's going on. Uh, I think it, it's clear we also need to have a very a much more nuanced debate about technology, not thinking that it's inherently good or inherently bad, uh, and, and thinking about the complexity of it. Um, uh, well, there's a very good point that, that this is not new. There are, there are mechanisms for dealing with this. There are ways to, to think about this, uh, and maybe we can look at some of those mechanisms. Um, it's, it's very clearly an issue for companies. Companies need to think about the ethical um, steps they're taking, and it's also very important for governments to be thinking about that. Um, and then, you know, lastly, quite clearly, which we ended on, it seems that data and ownership of data, personal data, is really, really going to be very important to the, the, uh, the future of technology and the ethical discussion over that future of technology. So, last of all, please join me in thanking our panelists and giving them a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.